All right. I'm glad everybody is here, the ones of you that have made it. And um, we, I, I want to give you a couple of things, and I'll mention this to you again in the morning service. I, uh, we're going to make some provisions. I've already discussed it with some of the guys, and uh, we won't be having an evening service this evening uh, because of the things going on. And I just want to make a couple of suggestions about that. Um, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of miss information out there and uh, so you want to be careful who you listen to and what you listen to and uh, pay attention more to what's going on locally than nationally and don't think because it's going nationally that it's going locally there are um, some people that are private schools that are still having school but they are shutting schools um, you know there's a 98 99 percent uh, recovery rate but then here's the thing it depends on who you listen to and if you're convinced you're going to die, then you listen to one side of the thing and you're ready to put saran wrap around your house and <laughs> that kind of thing and get a tinfoil hat and all that, which is fine if that's what you want to do. And then you listen to the other side and then it's downplayed to an extreme on that end, like downplaying it too much. Um, I, I made her stay home today just because she's not going to not be able to shake hands or talk to people or whatever, and for her, it can be, a flu for her is a little different than a flu for me, I'll just say that. So, so use your head, but, but be careful about f fear mongering and be careful about, you know, I think I know what it is. Nobody knows anything about all of this stuff. You, there's not enough information yet. You know, some preachers are, you know, this is it, you know, and I've changed my position and it's is the plagues that are coming. Th this is nothing like what's coming in the tribulation. So it's, it's an unusual event. It's worldwide. A good opportunity for 666 to step on the scene. <laughs> Great. But I know before he steps on the scene, we'll be out of the scene. Yeah. So, but but uh, the reason I'm not having the service tonight is because I don't want to put pressure on people to feel like I'm testing your spirituality just to see whether or not you're spiritual. Give you a couple of times off Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then we'll see what we do about next Sunday. In the meantime... Be careful about shaking paws. And uh, if you got an existing condition like obesity or something like that, or um, why would I say that? But at any rate, if you, if you have that, you know, use your head. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I've already got the flu. I've had several people today call. They've got sinus trouble or whatever. It might, okay, stay home. I mean, no problem. Nobody's taking roll today. Um, you just, you know, to see who is and who isn't. And those of us that are here, praise the Lord. I wanted to be in church today. I wanted to see you all again and, and see what happens. Um, you know, if you're elderly, according to what they tell us, you're more apt to get it. So I'm in the crosshairs. <laughs> so just be careful about what you do and stay out of people's faces. And we're not going to shake hands today. And Got a family going to join the church, but I said, can we wait? Because I want them to be able to come in and, you know, get their hands. I don't want them to be right off the bat. They join the church and then nobody shakes their hand and they got a complaint right off the bat. So, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, we'll get all that done. All right. Second Timothy, thank you for coming. I appreciate it very much. And um, uh, Lord willing and the church don't rise, we'll be able to meet um, uh, next Sunday also. But Pay attention to what your local folks say and, and remember, you know, just to watch out and use your, use your head. I, I, think, I do think it's odd that people right now are more concerned about toilet paper than they are food. <laughs> That's the craziest thing in the world. I've seen no less than four articles of people fighting over toilet paper at Costco's, you know, and they call the police because they're having a fight over toilet paper, you know, and I'm thinking... You got to be kidding me, man. I mean, but <clears throat> lest I digress, I, I'm not trying to downplay. I guess if you got to go, you got to go. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Are you in 2 Timothy? If you will, please, let's pl we better pray. We need to <laughs> wipe that out. Father, we sure thank you for your many blessings and how good you've been to us. Lord, thank you for what an encouragement it is to me to walk in and see a house full of folks already for Sunday school. 
I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to get something from you today, that you might minister to us and bless us as only you can. I pray, Lord, that the mamas and the grandmamas and the other ones that are staying home today with the little ones and protecting them, that maybe they'll be watching and maybe they might give them something from you that'll help them out throughout the time. And those that are sick among us and those that are unable to attend, might you comfort them as only you can. And Lord, help us as we gather together and weather the storm together that it might draw us closer together and knit our hearts together for a common cause. We'd ask now your blessings upon what it is we're about to undertake. Pray for wisdom from the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, if you're in 2 Timothy now, I stopped off here at verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I explained to you the importance of right divisions in your Bible. And the illustration that I use on a regular, uh, a, a rather frequent basis is, is that in the Old Testament, there's certain dietary laws that you're not allowed to have. Certain things, uh, skin, uh, fish and uh, uh, scales that doesn't have fins and scales, so you can't have catfish or shrimp and lobster and you can't have pork, no cloven hoof, all that other stuff. All right, then on the New Testament in 2 Timothy, he says, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with prayer and thanksgiving. So what does that mean? That means in Pauline epistles, if I rightly divide my Bible, not only does it apply in dietary laws, it also applies in sacrificial laws. Remember I had mentioned to you before that in the book of Leviticus is a full of them. The majority of them are in the book of Leviticus. And you start looking in the book of Leviticus and there's a ram, a lamb, a he goat, a she goat, a turtle dove, a pigeon. Uh, there's a wave offering. There's a drink offering. There's a sheath, sheave offering. There's offerings and different things and ceremonial things, religious rites that you have and that you take place in and things that are for priests and all that. In the New Testament, you're kings and priests. You don't go to a priest to have your sins confessed. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So you don't have to go to the priest. And secondly, you don't have to go through a ceremonial washing of things. What can I do? I come through ceremonially. What, what do I do? I come to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm saved, I confess my sins. I see you, Miss Beth, back there, by the way. Glad you're here. Good to have you. And so I ran into her in the airport. She's a nurse, so we're all safe today. But here, here's the thing. Hospice nurse. Anyhow... <laughs> <laughs> For me to live as Christ and to die is okay, so she'll be here to comfort you on your way out, you know. Preacher, tell him I'll be there in a little while, you know. See you later. <laughs> Y'all need to relax a little bit. A little too tense. But, but here's the thing I need for you to understand. We don't have to go through religious rituals anymore. You can pray anywhere you want to. You can pray anytime you want to. Now when it comes to your salvation, it's not by having a scapegoat that runs out into the wilderness. It's not by having the goat slaughtered so that the blood can be spread on the altar so that the priest can go in and make intermission or make intercession for your sins. Now because of Calvary's cross, you can go boldly with the throne of God. And right now that's an important thing. It's good that you can pray. It's good that you can pray right now. Amen. You say, why? Well, things are a little uncertain right now. I mean, things are a little uncomfortable. I'm coming through Atlanta yesterday after I left San Antonio, and I'm in Atlanta, and all of a sudden, nine TSA agents show up there, and they roll out a full-scale security check and all that stuff. You say, what did you do? Well, I wasn't going to do like the guy behind me who's screaming at him. That's a good way to get in trouble. I wanted to get home. And so I'm, you say, what did you do? I, I prayed. You say, well, you in the airport? Yeah, sure. I mean, my mouth was moving and my head was, you know, where my mind was, was up there in the Lord. But I, I wasn't praying out loud, but I was praying, could you get me through, please? Could you just let me get through? I just want to get on the plane, please. I want to get home. I don't want to get here. Help this idiot to shut up behind me before he gets us all in trouble. <laughs> Lord, would you shut him up, please? What an idiot, man. I'm, I'm, I wanted to say that to him, but I'm thinking, this ain't the time, buddy. This ain't the time. Shut up, man. Shut up. Shut up, you know. And anyway, you say, why do you tell me that? In the Old Testament, you couldn't do that. In the New Testament, you know how you get saved? You get saved by asking Jesus Christ. And just like that, you get saved. Just like that. In the Old Testament, things were different. They were ceremony. You had to depend upon the priest. It was a picture. It's a shadow. It's a type for you to go by. So you don't throw those things aside in the sense of not learning. The things in the Old Testament were written for our admonition and what? Our admonition and our what? You can learn from history. You can learn from things in the Old Testament. You can learn from types and shadows and figures in the Old Testament, right? 
So you have to pay attention to those things, but you've got to make sure you're looking at them through Pauline glasses. You say, why? That's called rightly dividing your Bible. That way you don't get hung up in the religious rituals. For instance, having to take a wafer or having to drink juice or wine. You say, well, what does that do? Well, we have the Lord's Supper here, but it doesn't save you. It's an ordinance in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there's something connected with it. But it has nothing to do with cannibalism. Cannibalism is forbidden in the Old Testament under grace, under the law, and in the New Testament. You're not literally ingesting the body of Christ. But you know how you become a part of the body of Christ? You want something wild? When you get down and pray, you know what the Bible does? The Bible said the Holy Spirit comes in and baptizes you, immerses your soul, and you're put into the body of Christ. Amen. Now, are you, can you get a hold of that? That's a, that's, a, that's a wild thing. He takes the Bible and he goes in there with a scalpel like in a surgeon's hand. And he, you know, he's, he, he doesn't have to wear a mask. There's no germs up there. And, he's got, and he says, scalpel, and it's the Bible. And it hands it to him and he said, hang on just a minute. Lord, would you please save my soul? And I don't want to go to hell and I know I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you to save me the best way I know how. Could you save me? And the Lord said, Whoosh, like that. And he says, you're saved. And the outer man says, well, I don't feel like it. And the inner man says, glory to God, boy, hallelujah, praise the Lord, man. I've been set free, man, free, free, free at last, man. I am free at last. I've been to the mountaintop. I'm telling you, I'm free. And the old man says, what do you mean you're free? And he said, I'm free from you, buddy. You're not dragging me to hell anymore. You say, what is that? That's salvation. You say, it's not, not, it can't be that simple. Yes. Now, here's, here's why it's important for you. You see, this is rightly dividing. Yes. Because in the Old Testament, your soul is connected to your body. So that means everything that your flesh does, it, it is connected to your soul so it dirties anything that it touches the wrong way. The soul that touches, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, the soul that this, remember? Okay. That's because it's connected in the Old Testament. So when somebody died in the Old Testament, they went to the heart of the earth. Not soul sleep, paradise before Abraham and the Jew, and then in Abraham's bosom uh, after that time. That's in the Bible. He that ascended is not he that descended first, Ephesians 4, into what? The lower parts of the earth. Why? He said to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. People that don't study and rightly divide their Bible, they say, Oh, well, he went to heaven. He can't go to heaven. Why? Hebrews says, Hebrews 10, It's impossible the blood of bulls of goat can take away sin. You're down there on a credit card. You're down there saying on the promise that he's going to come. You say, why was that? Because your soul's connected to your body in the Old Testament. Amen. Now, in the New Testament, what happens to me right now? I, I don't want to do it, but I, I'm going to try not to do it. But if I sin, my fellowship with Jesus Christ is broken, but my soul is saved. You say, why? It's not contributed or attributed to my soul. It's not connected. So whatever my flesh does. Now, hyper-dispensationalists will do this. You know what he'll say? He'll say to you, well, if I can't sin anymore, which I? Well, if I can't sin anymore, which I? Which one can't sin anymore? My soul. Right? But be honest now. You're going to tell me your flesh can't sin? Well, good night, man. I'd have to be getting saved every 15 minutes sometimes. You say, what? Well, especially when you're driving. You see, now I got you all kind of like, well, maybe I can kind of see that, you know. <laughs> or maybe, you know, you're married. <clears throat> okay, every couple hours then. But, but here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what you want to grab a hold of, you want to get. Is that in the New Testament, one of the greatest things about right division is, is that when the Lord teaches you about division, it sets you free so that it's not contributed or attributed to how I live as to whether I'm saved. Now, I'm going to give you a flip side of that before I move to the next verse. That means that no matter whether or not I wear a shirt and tie or a coat and tie or have a haircut or I don't, and I do need one bad, but at any rate, whether I have a haircut, whether I have facial hair, whether I wear a three-quarter length sleeve, whether I wear a dress, whether I wear pants, whether I have a, a long hair or I have short hair, whether or not I have a Bible, don't have a Bible, come to church, don't come to church, pray, read, study, give, do all so uh, All that might be an outward testimony that you're saved, but it has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. Now, the liberty in that is, is that you don't have to try to prove to yourself or anybody else that you're saved by what you do. You get the liberty to serve the Lord if you want to. 
Now that, sh that ought to just make, I mean, literally, that ought to make a wooden Indian shout. That means I'm not trying to prove it to anybody. You don't look saved. Thank you. You look saved. Thank you. That'll probably change in the next 15 minutes if you keep talking. <laughs> right? So, so what does that do? That gives me liberty to realize I still got to struggle with that old man. Here's the good thing. It also gives me an opportunity to show the Lord I love him. You say, why? I'm not serving him because he's got a gun to my head. I'm not serving him because I have to. I'm serving him because I get to. You know, the Lord said, do you love me? Yeah, okay, keep my commandments. Who's he saying that to? Can't be my soul that's saved. Who's the one out of control? Who's the one that doesn't want to obey commands? <laughs> I'll just tell you, it's that old man. You know what I get to do? I get to show him I love him by putting that old man to the cross and saying, you're going to die today. You say, what happened? Paul said, I die daily. Now, Paul's a pretty good Christian. If you look at him, you follow his life very much at all. You find he's a pretty good Christian. Yet Paul says 27 years after he's saved, the things I should do, I don't. And the things I shouldn't, I do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Paul said, wait a minute, I can't say in me because my soul's in me and it's saved. That means the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me. I become the tabernacle. I become the temple. He's dwelling inside me right now. Right? Okay, I know this is pretty deep for some of you, but you know what he says? He said, I got to qualify that. Now, what am I doing? I'm showing you basic rightly dividing. Paul just rightly divided for you to see. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, two natures. Yeah, a, a, a psychiatrist would call you legally schizophrenic. You say, why? Because you're taking orders from two different people. Don't you? Amen. Ain't it hard to get them on the same page? Yep. See, I never heard of such in all my life, preacher. That's the most ridiculous thing. Ever. But see, that's the problem. You think you're crazy. If once you get saved and then all of a sudden the stuff you used to do, the Lord says to you, now, what are you doing that for? And you're like, because I always did it. And the Lord said, well, why are you doing it now? Because I like it. And he says, well, I don't. And you're like, what? Who are you? <laughs> I'm the new guy. Yes. You get ready to throw the suds back and it comes to the table and something kind of feels like it kicks you in the stomach and you look down there and you, you see it different you ever saw it before. Now it looks a little more like a urine sample than it does. <laughs> and, and you're thinking, and boy, that sure would taste good. And something says, no, it wouldn't. And some says, sure it will, man. What's the big deal? Go ahead, chug a lug, have a good time, enjoy yourself. And the other guy says, I don't want to enjoy that. Don't be dragging me in there. I don't want nothing to do with that. Don't put that up there. People are going to talk about you, man. What do you think? And, and you're thinking, who are you? I said, I'm the new guy. I'm the new guy. Something comes on the box. And now you hear an expletive come on the box. And I know you're a good moral person, but you don't realize you've gotten accustomed to the stuff, you know. And then all of a sudden, something comes across and something says to you, man. What in the world's that, man? I don't, I don't, I don't like that. That's nasty. That's feel, that just makes me feel bad. And the other guy says, what do you mean you feel bad? I feel good. Wow. <laughs> and, and the new guy said, I don't feel any good at all. Now you see, it can't be that. That's in me. That is in my flesh. 27 years after that boy saved, three of which the Apostle Paul had spent on the backside of the Arabian Desert with the Lord himself, had a great conversion experience and teaching the Bible. And you know what he says? I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No zero, hole of a donut, nothing, nada. That's why when you talk to people about spiritual matters, you got to figure out which one you're talking to. I made a statement when I was in Virginia last week. I said to him, I said, folks, I said, here's the, the hard thing. One of you, two, one, two, one of, the, of the two of you is going to be offended when we're done with the meeting. And you could see the question mark. I said, one of the two of you, if you're saved, there's two of you. The soul's going to be happy and the flesh is not going to be, or the flesh is going to be happy and the soul's not going to be. If I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, you're supposed to go out of here and say, I didn't like that at all. I didn't appreciate that at all. How's he talk like that? 
raise his voice, get all upset, jacked up. Who's he think he is? What is he doing? Which one's talking? Because the other guy's going, man, I like that. Boy, tune it up, boy. I like that, boy. Make that flesh. Haul it down there to the altar. And that other one's going, I don't want to go down there. I don't want to go down there. And the soul's going, go down there, man. Go down there. And there's this war going on. I'm in Galatians 5. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. Right. It's a battle. Which one can't? The flesh. And the soul wants to do it. But the flesh says you ain't. And the soul said we'll see. That's why it's important what you eat. Your dietary practices matter. Look, if you're taking a lot of you're taking notes right now. Write the word death down on the sheet of paper. Do it in capital letters. D E A T H. Isn't that the way you spell it? All right, now look at that. Under your D, write death. And under H, write hell. You say, what keeps you from, what takes you from death to hell? Well, look at the T right there. It's a cross. Look at the three middle letters right there. They're eat. You say, what can take me there? Wrong diet. Don't eat the things you ought to eat. I'm talking spiritually. If you don't partake of the Word of God and you don't partake of the things God would have you, if you don't partake of the Lord, you know what the Lord says about Himself? Taste and see, for the Lord He is good. Amen. You eat the wrong things, you get the wrong diet, you go from death, you live your life, and then you go straight to hell. But if you stop at the T, at the cross... <laughs> you can avoid hell. Amen. I could almost Amen. break off and preach yes, right sir. there. <laughs> you got to stop at the T. Mm. But you can't ever ignore the dietary rule that is still there. And that is, if I keep feeding things that please the flesh. Now, look, I'm not talking about whether or not you eat a steak or a hamburger, whether or not you eat donuts. That's not what I'm talking about. It will make no difference to me. That's your business. That's your dietary stuff. and may cause you physical problems. I'm talking about your spiritual diet. That's why the right church is, the right, is important. The right Bible is important. The stuff that you listen to, which one you feed. That old preacher used to say, and people made fun of him. They thought, you know, here's a guy with 170 IQ. How can somebody like that come up with something so simple? I don't know. Here's the creator of the universe. You want to know how he preaches? Here's the creator of the universe. Here's the one that knows every molecule in you. He knows DNA and RNA strands in you. He knows where your weaknesses in your immune system are. He knows everything that makes you up, how your kidneys function, your renal function. He knows your heart function, your parasympathetic nervous system. He knows your pericardium. He knows your heart. He knows the whole bit. I mean, he's got you down pat. He knows every hair on your cotton picking head right now. And here's what he says. He's preaching to some guys. You know what he said? He says, um, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Oh, what is that for the creator of the universe? Well, why would you make fun of a guy with 170 IQ who says, well, it comes down to this. If a man comes and brings you two dogs, he said, let's just use colors. He said, if you paint sin, you paint it black. And if you paint purity, you paint it white. So let's, you know, woman in a wedding dress, white, and paint sin black. And that's not a racial thing. And, and so he says, okay, let's do that. Now, if somebody brings you a black puppy, he said, let's say they're German shepherds. Brings you a black German shepherd and brings you a white German shepherd. And then comes back in six months and says, let's throw them in a pit and see who's going to win, who will fight the best. And he said, I'll guarantee you every time, it'll be whichever one you fed the most, whichever one you paid the most attention, whichever one you spent time training, that one has the best opportunity to win in the fight when you put them in the pit. And then he comes on down there to the end of that board and he said, and that black dog is flesh. And he said, the flesh dog likes the TV and the magazines and the modern this and the modern that and the rock and roll and the bumpity bumpity bump 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 and all that stuff. And he said, and the spiritual dog, he likes the Bible and he likes preaching and he likes psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. And this dog likes rock and roll music and likes the modern vernacular, things like that and contemporary stuff and charismatic foolishness and emotions and the spiritual like that. Right. You say, what is he doing? He's trying to tell you a very, very important lesson. If you want to be successful as a Christian, you've got to feed the right dog. Amen. People get offended when they say they're, they're dog. All right, take the word good. You want an acronym? You can't spell good without God. Amen. Think about it. G-O-O-D, right? You drop one of those O's, you spell it backwards, you know what you got? You got dog. 
You say, what are you? You're a dog without God. Amen. <laughs> so why, would you, why, why are you breaking it like that and making it so simple? Because the Lord makes all those things simple for Amen. you. Amen. You take the word uh, devil. In the middle of the word devil is evil. What does he think about? He thinks about I right in the middle of the thing. Amen. You listen to him, you'll be ill, as the preacher used to say. You say, what does he f focus on? He focuses on evil and he's vile. The I-L-E. It's all part of the same word. Amen. You get God in there and you see good there. No other, no other language has a word for good that has God in it. Did you know that? Only the English language. You think that's a coincidence? Are you looking at your Bible right now when you're not looking at me? Are you looking at your Bible? What language is that? It's interesting, isn't it? Your Bible's put out in England and it's stamped by a king. And where the word of the Lord is, there's power. And where the word of the king is, there's power. And what does he say in there? It's 1611, that's nine. He says, Holy Bible, that's nine. He says, King James, that's nine. Nine's the number for perfect fruit. That's beyond new beginnings. Nine is the number not to start over. Nine is the number for absolute, the, the epitome of perfection. So you've got nines that are there. You say, why would God do that? I don't know. Why would He do that? Giving you a good diet. You have to pay attention to it. Now, let me just say this about that. If you're going to study and read your Bible, you have to understand something. One of you ain't going to like it. Amen. People say, I just don't have time to read your Bible. Which one? Which one? Who's talking to you? Who's running you? You can tell by how they talk to you who's running you. I don't, I don't have time to read the Bible. And then you sit down and somebody says, you've got time to watch a ball game. Yep. And you're saying, shut up, man. I've got to have some time. You said, but you said you didn't have time to read the Bible. I'm hungry. Read the Bible. I'm busy right now. Which one's busy? Amen. See, they're fighting all the time. Flesh. First thing you do in the morning, your flesh says to you, I, I need to empty my bladder. And from that moment on, you say, fine, I'm getting a cup of coffee. I'm going to read my Bible. He said, well... I got a busy day today and I, I'll get it after I grab my shower, but I need to get a shower. The tie doesn't match my suit. I got a problem at work. And the puppy on the inside is saying, uh, can I have something to eat? Can I get a little puppy chow? Can I get something? I got to run the whole day too. You're, you're taking time to feed and pamper that, train that. You know what's happening? Your flesh trains you. Take care of me first. And then what happens? You knock the scraps off and give it to the white dog there at the end, a little puppy dog, and he stays a puppy and he stays anemic. And every time a struggle comes and the next thing you know, that little white dog, you know, gets up and has that little puppy bark and that kind of thing with them little sharp pointed teeth and, you know, and he growls and he thinks he's, and then all of a sudden that big old dog comes in, whoa, 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 whoa. And that little puppy backs down into his corner. You see, it can't be that, it's that simple. Amen. It's that simple. That's why you're here now. People say, why should I go to church? You've you got you to feed. Yes. You've got to eat. Got to eat to stay alive. Now, when he's talking about rightly dividing, that's what he's talking about. It's not just esoterically uh, reading things in the Bible and dividing Scripture. It's dividing life. Oh, look, he says, wherefore, this is in uh, 1 Corinthians, he says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Yep. Watch. Touch not the unclean thing. For what fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. What's he telling you? Somebody's got to separate from some things. You say, why? Because things that used to be okay with your flesh, they're not okay with the Lord anymore. And now the light's turned on. And because people don't understand that conflict and don't understand what's going on because there's not a lot of explanation, they just say, man, ever since I got saved, I'm going crazy. Well, no, you, list, you have two voices to listen to now. Amen. Now here's what will happen. You'll try to drown out that second voice. Sure. With all kind of activities and all kind of things and all kind of stuff and all kind of reasoning and you'll get to the point where you're trying to drown out where well, that voice is just that still small voice. The Bible says their conscience, we went over all this stuff. You can get the whole series on conscience, but then your conscience gets defiled and then before long your conscience gets darkened and then before long your conscience is seared and you can't hear him if he's screaming at you. 
When that happens to you, the dog can't get anything through a straw. He wired his jaws shut. He doesn't have the ability to get anything. The only way you can get every now and then, he'll try to suck through a halfway uh, 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 dammed up uh, straw. He can't, he can't get any nourishment. Now, you can't kill him. He's headed to heaven. But you can starve him. You can weaken him. By what? Feeding that guy right there. So that's what has to do with rightly dividing. This is important. Now, now it's interesting if you notice the Bible. He says rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to pay attention to context. You also have to pay a, attention to the order of things. Notice what happens. After we talk word of truth, he said, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Wow. You mean right behind rightly dividing, he says, shun vain and profane babblings. And then the next verse, he said, their word does eat as with a canker. That's like gangrene. That's like a, a nasty disease. I told you uh, about that before. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, which I'm going to give you in a second. But isn't it interesting that the first thing he said to you is right after rightly dividing, he said, you better watch somebody and how they preach to you. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Amen. You mean doctrinal issues? Well, isn't it just like the Lord to put the most important thing first? People think where I go to church and what Bible I have and who I listen to doesn't make any difference. According to him, it does. Yeah. Part of the way that you rightly divide is, is you pay attention. By rightly dividing, you can discern who's preaching the truth and who isn't. That's right. Amen. So if a guy gets up here and he says, Repent and be baptized, everyone of you in the name of Jesus Christ, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. You say, Okay, that's Acts 2.38. Okay, Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than that which I preach, let him be accursed. Paul yeah. says, 1 Corinthians preaching, how that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, buried, raised again the third day according to Scripture. Now, which is it? There's two gospels. Yep. Which is it? Repent and be baptized to get the Holy Ghost or be saved and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Which is it? Well, if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you'll think, well, I, I guess I better be baptized for salvation. A lot of people have been baptized. They're no more saved than a billy goes. like taking a shower or taking a bath. All they did was get wet. Right. Baptism doesn't save you, right. but it did. Yeah. See, that's a mistake people make. Yes. Baptism never saved you. Oh, yes, it did. Amen. Baptism revealed the Messiah in John chapter number 1. The apostle, I mean, uh, John the Baptist comes along and the baptism comes up there and that's to reveal the Messiah and show repentance for their sin. But for you, baptism's not connected with your salvation. You say, well, aren't you a Baptist? Yeah, I'm a Baptist, but I'm a Bible believer. I'm not a Baptist just because I believe that baptism is a good testimony to people that are without the baptism for the dead. 1 Corinthians 15. You believe in that? Sure I do. What does that mean? I'll get up here and get baptized for my dad that's dead? No, he's saved. He don't need to be baptized for. You say, well, but he says baptism for the dead. Now, I'm going to show you rightly divided, and please don't be offended, okay? If you were a Mormon before, just hear me out. Here's the thing. They teach that you're being baptized, so they send you down in South Florida, or they send you out in Utah, and they get you in the thing where they got the 12 oxen around the big, huge baptismal pool, and you fill out a certificate of all the people that are dead, and you get baptized for people that have died in your family that weren't Mormons, and if you get baptized for them, then they're assured to be a part of your family in the celestial sense when you get up to heaven. You say, surely they don't believe that. Yes, they do believe that. And it says baptism for the dead. Now, I know you know and been taught, and many of you have been to Bible school and stuff, the baptism for the dead has to do with people that are watching somebody be baptized that are dead in trespasses and sin. Not physically dead. How could you be baptized for the dead? Well, what they say is, is that they've already died and they've gone to hell. Now, watch. Don't Catholics teach something similar? Sure they do. They teach the doctrine of purgatory and limbo. Yeah. They still believe that. They yep. still teach it. Yep. Go check with the current pope if you don't believe me. You know what they believe? They believe if you give enough money and you do enough works, then you can move them from a, permanent, from a place of uh, being tortured and, and uh, having to purge themselves and be cleaned up of their sins. And if you give enough that you can then in their place, like a vicarious atonement, your dollar bills will buy them out of their place of suffering. Well, let me just say, if that was your mama or your grandmama down there and the Pope had convinced you that they were down there screaming and being tortured and being flayed alive like a deer uh, and you had a little bit of money, don't you think you'd want to... How, how much? Give you my house, give you my card? Take widows' houses and make long prayers? 
That's what the Lord warned you about, the Pharisees. Catholic don't even show up until a priest got a hold of a Latin document and decided to write it in way up in 1700 and something. We're the first church. Where did you get that? You know what they say? You can pay your way out. We're poor. Well, guess they have to burn. Hope somebody be willing to step in in your place. Baptism for the dead. You say, what is that? Mormons believe they can get baptized. People go in and get baptized for you because you're a Baptist, because you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and you're trusting the blood of Jesus Christ to get you there. They say, well, I'm going to get baptized for you. You can't get baptized for me. I was baptized into his death when I got saved. Amen. And now I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit and I don't have to speak with other tongues to prove it. Amen. The initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the spirit of prophecy, which is to preach. That simply means it's a testimony of I was going to hell and now I'm going to heaven. Amen. How can you, I just prophesied. Yeah, sure. You've never been there. But you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't believe it. That's right. You're prophesying. You're nincompoops. You're nuts. You're crazy. You've never been there. You don't even know if it's really there. You're going to a place you've never seen. You're, gonna, you're believing a man you've never seen. Yeah. You believe that he has washed away some kind yes. of sin yeah. thing, that yeah. sin's going to take you to hell. Yeah. What is hell? Yeah. Hell's on earth. What a terrible thing hell is. Hell's just what we're going through now. What do you mean? Because uh, you, you know, these preachers have been praying for years about this sports thing, uh, causing people to stay out of church. Yeah. Well, they finally got their prayers answered. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's kind of got you bummed out now. You're kind of up, upset because it's kind of like, well, you know, I mean, what are we going to do for, for what? You can't go to Walmart? They ain't got any toilet paper? <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. You get the newspaper? I don't, anyway, let me, let me. <laughs> I never thought of that. I could just cut strips. And, but anyway, so, so here's the thing you want to grab a hold of. The baptism for the dead right there is Paul so in you that when we baptize somebody in a couple of weeks here, if this mess doesn't get us where we can't have services, I got a baptism. Boy, I led to the Lord back here a few weeks ago. And he said, I, I want to be baptized. I said, okay, you understand you're saved? Yes, sir, I know I'm saved. If you die before then, oh, gee, I said, I'm going to heaven, but I want to be baptized. I said, why do you want to be baptized? He said, I want everybody to know I'm saved. You say, what is it? It's a picture of what you've already done. Amen. That's why you can't do it at eight. Amen. You can't do it at eight days old. Oh. You can't have a godfather and a godmother that can transfer you into heaven. And I don't care how much they watch over for you, guardian angels and stuff like that. It doesn't make any difference. Listen, the Lord said this. He said, you got to know what you did. You get baptized. You say, well, I got christened and I was set aside. You don't even remember it. No. It's a decision you make. Right. You can't trust your baptism to save you. You say, well, preacher, I was baptized. Okay, good. Did you get saved after you got baptized? Years ago when we started over here in the little building and things like that, after we had started my living room, we had, a, we had a number of people who even came up through Southern Baptist churches and they realized they made a false profession. They joined the church and they thought that meant and got baptized. They thought that meant they were saved. That was taught back then. You know, come join the church. It was synonymous with teaching the church is synonymous. I mean, joining the church is synonymous with uh, being saved and then being baptized. Follow the Lord and believers baptism. And so they'd get baptized. Never a profession of faith. Never repentance from sin. Nothing. Just, you know, I joined the church and, you know, mom and dad joined the church. So I joined the church and so I, I, I got saved. I, okay, I heard you join the church, but... You didn't get saved. You didn't ask the Lord to save you. And so many people after that was over said, well, preacher, I've already, been, uh, I've already been baptized. I said, did you get baptized after you got saved? Well, no. I said, okay. You can get baptized again. Amen. Not because you're changing churches, right. but right. baptism right. follows salvation. Yes. You know what they did? They lined up and we baptized them. This is back in the days when that thing over there, we didn't even have a heater. We didn't have nothing. That water came right out of the middle. There's a well, an old well, right up in about the middle of about that third pew, right in the middle of that thing. It had a, a four inch pipe or two inch pipe coming up out of it. And that water was cold. It felt like it was coming out of the Arctic. And pump that stuff over there under the ground and it would fill that old concrete block baptismal thing that we painted about 50 times to try to keep it from leaking, hold the water long enough to dunk them and get over there. And of course I had on waders, which helped a lot, but you can feel the cold through waders. It's cold. And they get in there <laughs> trying to get his, you know, I usually ask them two questions and they're kind of like, hurry, hurry up. <laughs> 
little Brad in there, man. I mean, he is, he's in there sh shaking like a dog trying to get rid of a peach seed, man. I mean, he's, he's just a little old thing, you know, and then get him down and get him up and thank you, I'm out of here, you know, kind of thing like that. But it was after salvation. That's important for you to get a hold of. So when Paul says that, the application for you is oftentimes people will come to see you get baptized and they're like, why is he getting baptized? And then the preacher says, now we don't believe baptism is connected with salvation. And repent and be baptized to everyone in the name of Jesus Christ is not our plan of salvation. Right. He's showing you a picture of what's already happened to him. Mm -hmm. I always ask them, old and young, you understand this water doesn't save you? Yes, sir, I understand. You say, why? So people understand water doesn't save you. Yeah. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away your sin. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that gives you the redemption. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that you're able to go in. Now, let me give you this real quick. I realize I'm close to my 1030 hour, but you want to grab a hold of this. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, his sin was purged out or through that red blood. When he offered that sacrifice for sin on the cross, you saw human blood coming down there, but God's blood was drained out of him and was presented to God up there in heaven right then. He didn't carry it up with him in buckets. He didn't have any in him. When he comes up, you know what he says? He said, see, don't, uh, see me and handle me for a spirit hath not what? Do you know it? Flesh and what? Bone. Bone. No blood in him. You say, what happened? That a Red Sea over you right now. It's right there. It's available to you. Well, isn't the devil swimming in it? Yeah, but he will never admit that he's wrong. He's too proud to take advantage of it. And he's swimming in it. It's all around. It's that close to you. You're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Where it's not in the universe. It's everywhere. It's right here. You say, what'd you do? I partook of it. You say, how'd you do that? You, no, I ask. And the Lord said, okay, take a bath. Cut my soul away from my body and immersed me in the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm in him right now, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Preacher, that's just, that's just too wild for me. Okay. That's how I got in. In Exodus 14, when they get ready to come out of there, don't they split a, a sea there going over there? What is the name of that sea? What sea? That's interesting. Who's chasing after them when they're running across that Red Sea? Pharaoh called the dragon. Who does the sea collapse on and kill? Pharaoh. No, don't get Yule Brenner over there, you know, going back to the... <laughs> Y'all got him. He's back in the palace. No, 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 no. The Bible said in Psalms, they found his body on the beach. You say, why? Well, at the rapture, guess what happens? The Lord, like Moses, splits the Red Sea. And you go up through the Red Sea. And devil's up there chasing the backsliders. <laughs> and then you'll be wishing you'd been living right. And you get over there on the other side where Canaan is. And the Lord collapses that thing and said, Satan is cast down to earth because he, and he's angry, he's wrathy because he knows his time is very short. And he's cast down. You say, you don't believe that? Just wait and see. Amen. You're going through a red sea. Amen. How did it get red? How did it get red? Amen. He died yes. and turned it red. A fellow told me one time, I'm not a photographer. They've been taking some pictures for some stuff that they're doing and all that kind of a deal, but they're not a photographer. I don't know if this is true or not. But he said in a particular kind of light and trying to get a certain kind of contrast, he said the way that you get something white is you use a red lens. I know this. I know that there's something about going red at nighttime that prevents you from being seen. You know that when you're out and... Um, operations and things like that, you use a red light. You say, why? It can't be picked up the way it can be picked up. Red light is easier seen in the day than at nighttime. That's why the police and all have blue lights at nighttime. But red lights are easier to see in the day than they are at night. And you're children of the day, the children of the light, not children of the night. There's something to that red that allows it and here's the way I look at it. The devil goes up there and he says, uh, knocks on the door. He can't get in anymore. He's knocking on heaven's door up there. And the Lord opens up, you know, yeah, what do you want? He said, peacock. He goes, yeah, what about him? He said, you see him down there? The Lord said, yeah, I see him. 
He said, you see what he just did, what he just thought, what he just said? The Lord said, yeah, I see it. He said, how come you're going to knock the tar out of him? Look at, he did, the devil hands him a list of things I did. And the Lord looks down there and he said, it looks pretty good to me. And the devil said, well, you're holy and you're righteous and you're pure and, and you're clean. And how could you say that he looks pretty good? I just told you what he did. And he said, I don't know. I guess your vantage point isn't the same as mine. Amen. I guess what you're looking at him through is not through the advantage of a red lens. Yes. Amen. Come on. Yep. I'm looking at him through the blood. Amen. Amen. And to me, he looks like a perfect little kid. I get up there to heaven. The Lord opens up the book, getting ready to read out all the charges on me. And my advocate steps up there and he's ready to have the charges read. And he's got a smirk on his face. And the devil's getting ready to, the old accuser, he's getting ready to lay it out. So he grabs that book, man, and says, this is a life of David Peacock. And he goes, I got him now, I got him now. And they have opening statements. And he says, I'd like to present to you evidence number one into admission for the court. And they log it into the courtroom and they log it in. Okay. And he cracks that up and he's... Amen. And he turns the page and he turns the page and the father says, uh, is there a problem or something? You've entered it into evidence. What evidence do you have against him? He said, well, it was all right here. Every bit of it. This, page, this thing was full. And he said, well, Let's see it. He hands it to the court. He looks through. He says, "Well, I don't see anything up here at all." Amen. Amen brother. You say what happened to it? The yeah. blood of Jesus Christ yeah. expunged every bit of it away. Yeah. Nothing there. And the devil said, "Well, they had to go somewhere." And the advocate said, "I took them, mm. Amen. and I paid for them. Yes. There you go. I took them, Amen. and I paid for them." Amen. See, he says, "You're a sinner." He said, "No, I had sin on me." not in me, but I took his sin for him. You take all those things and they charge them to me and I paid the price for them. They're not still there anymore. You say, why? Blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from, say it one more time, all sin. You say, well, it can't be that way, you know. And all. Yeah, all sin. Now, it's a biblical principle. You want to get a hold of that. What am I trying to teach you? Rightly dividing in a practical sense. Heavenly Father, bless the uh, Sunday school hour. I pray that you'll be with us in the upcoming.